Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tamiko Brown Nagan, Dean of the Harvard Radcliffe Institute. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our annual Julia S. Phelps Lecture in the Arts and Humanities. Recent Phelps lectures have featured remarkable writers and artists such as Marilyn Robinson, Min Jin Lee, and Ayadeli Cassell. Today, we add to that illustrious group the acclaimed writer Kiese Lehman. Julia Phelps, for whom this series is named, was a Radcliffe College alumna and a beloved teacher in Harvard's German department in the Harvard Extension School and here at Radcliffe. When Julia retired from Radcliffe, her family, friends, and colleagues established this lecture in her honor, and we are so grateful for their support. Before we begin, let me also acknowledge the members of the Radcliffe Institute Leadership Society and all our annual donors. Your generosity keeps Radcliffe programming free and open to the public, and we thank you. Kiese Lehman is the 2020-21 William and Flora Hewlett Foundation Fellow here at Radcliffe, and he's spending the year focused on his latest project, and so on, and academic horror. He's also the Hubert H. McAlexander Professor of English and Creative Writing at the University of Mississippi, and the recipient of many literary awards. Kiese's powerful 2018 book, Heavy, an American memoir, won the Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Nonfiction, among other prizes, and the New York Times named it one of the best, excuse me, one of the 50 best memoirs of the past 50 years. Kiese also is the author of the recently reissued collection of essays, How to Slowly Kill Yourself and Others in America, and Long Division, a novel that will be reissued later this year. Kiese's writing is fearless and candid, and he grapples with fraught but critically important subjects, including violence, racism, family, gender, addiction, and weight. In reviews and reflections on Kiese's work, one word appears again and again, honest. And Heavy opens with the befittingly and perhaps deceptively frank statement, I wanted to write a lie. The memoir Kiese wanted to write, the memoir many readers crave, is a progress narrative in which the writer struggles, overcomes obstacles, and achieves success by journey's end. Instead, Kiese gives us something much more powerful, what he describes as a reckoning. He shares the pain, the challenges, the beauty he experienced as a black boy in Mississippi. But where other memoirs might end, the triumph of his entrance to elite universities or his achievement of broad liter literary acclaim, Kiese continues subverting the progress narrative's typical art towards resolution. For Kiese, this was not only an artistic choice, but also a critique of the typical narrative. As a society, our preference for tidy resolutions can hinder the vital work of acknowledging and addressing past harm. Without such reckoning, harm continues and deep issues are left to fester. Yet Heavy is neither an autobiography nor a tell-all. Kiese has said he left out many stories that are not his to tell. Reckoning with difficult and uncomfortable truths is a complex undertaking and process matters. Kiese once said that his primary goal as an author is to discover things I don't understand, discover different ways into things I do understand. In so doing, he gives his readers profound and compelling stories, and even more importantly, he helps us in our own individual and collective quests for understanding. Such exploration is central to the work of the Radcliffe Institute, and this is one of many reasons we're so thrilled to count Kiese as a member of this unique community. Today, we have the opportunity to witness what Kiese describes as the art of making the art. Over the next hour, he'll create a new work as he considers the ethics of writing about Black Americans' experiences in and around American institutions of higher education. At several points in the program, Kiese will be joined in conversation by Courtney R. Baker, an associate professor in the Department of English at the University of California, Riverside. 
Courtney's scholarship examines visual culture and black life. And she's the author of Humane Insight, looking at images of African-American suffering and death. We're delighted to have Courtney with us here as well. Following Kiese and Courtney's last discussion, we'll turn to audience questions. You can use the Q&A feature on Zoom to submit your questions at any point during the program. We only ask that you keep your questions brief so that we can address as many of them as possible. With that, let's begin. Welcome Kiese, the floor is yours. What's going on? Court, I think you're on mute. I'm gonna be here now. All right, what's I going on? To, I was trying to be like, oh, oh, <laughs> oh, hey, how are you doing? How are you? I'm okay, I'm great. I feel like so lucky to be here. That was just the most generous uh, introduction that I could ever receive. I like you rocking the H today. Um, we don't have that long to talk, fam. So I wanted to right. know, I've been thinking a lot about these college campuses. Something happened yesterday that tore me up. But before I get into it, have you read the Reed Pickens book, Black Madness? I mean, I oh. have it right here. I generally oh. tend to keep it by my bed. Uh, I think about it a lot. <laughs> I just, I, just What's up? I, I read it when it first came out. And after what happened yesterday, I started rereading it. Um, and then our friend asked me to hop on Zoom and talk with him. I thought about it, but he actually wanted to talk about it. He actually wanted me to watch him talk about his new work that was on origin and Black Death. Um, what do you think yeah. about that? Uh, those things are interesting. Origin, <laughs> who's, who's origin? That's my question. That's my question. I mean, I feel like he was trying to flip. I feel like he was trying to flip Black Madness. And I also mm. think he was bringing in Humane Insight, your first book in this really strange way. But at the core of his argument is that every rhetorically innovative, radical um, creation in the last, in the, in the 20th century has come from a place that he calls the musty. Right, which is a place like 20 miles between Rosedale and Greenwood. But I, I'm, I'm talking to you now with a smile on my face, fam, because I'm really terrified about like what our friend has been doing. Um, is he okay? Is this the space we should talk about that? Can we talk about black folks and their relationships with illness of all kinds? If white folk might be watching, what you think? Wow. That's a lot. <laughs> where is our friend again? Our friend, I mean, that's the question. Where, where is our friend now? You know, I left him yesterday in a basement. Um, and, and that's what I, what I really wanted to talk to you about. When I was on the Zoom with him, he was going off, you know, doing this like overt performance shit that I think a lot of us do when white folks are watching. And he's going off, but at the same time, I get a message from him on my chat mm -hmm. that says, the candy lady and the sharecropper need the plug and the imagination for black madness. The motherfucker capitalized the C, the L, the S, the P, the Not N. Not black though. You know he didn't capitalize black. <laughs> <laughs> you know he didn't capitalize black. But you know, I'm looking up at my screen. And I think you were, I saw your name and uh, it's one of the people who was watching and the dude is just shivering. You know what I'm saying? He's, he's, he's shivering. Did you see that? I saw that, what was that about? I, I don't know. I assumed it was like, I mean, I do know. I think it was because he'd been told he was denied tenure by his department earlier in the semester. And like the case would somehow now be in the hands of the president but something weird was happening behind this camera. And, and, and you and I haven't talked about this at all. Um, so I want no, to use the word grapple. Rough. Right, this is, this, I want to use the word grapple, right? Like the department did like denied his tenure because he unsatisfactorily grappled with your book in <laughs> Humane Insight. And by unsatisfactorily grappled, I will say a lot of people say he plagiarized, right? So our friend and his project wrote, 
quoted you, right? And you wrote, I'm absolutely not considering these manipulations and utilizations of the black body and pain and death to be a consequence of black people's intuitive response to suffering and injustice. Quite to the contrary, I'm insisting that these choreographies of humane insight are deliberate. Our friend wrote the same thing, but in the last sentence he said, I'm insisting that these choreographies of humane insight are deliberate and rooted in the musty and black madness. Humane insight is musty, black and mad. And I think something might've been going on with him at that point. So it's, it's almost like he wanted to get caught. And I was wanting to talk to you for so many reasons, but like he, he professes that your work is the linchpin of his work but I don't know if you've ever seen it in his work. Have you? Well, it's, an, it's always an honor to be quoted, but I guess <laughs> plagiarism is a quotation. Uh, but you know how we do. What do you think? Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna get to the, get to the, get to it. And, um, and after I tell it, I wanna I wanna ask you a question. And I'm gonna start in the middle. Cause I don't really plan on making it um to the end. Yeah. All right, Court, so I get to the parking lot of our friend's apartment at like 4.30 yesterday. I text him and I tell him I'm in the car. He comes out and his face is covered in all black, but he's cut a hole in the left eye. It's kind of ripped. I can see him, he can see me. His face is tucked in his chest. His one hand is in the pocket of these long Memphis Grizzly shorts. As soon as our friend gets close to the car, he takes his hand out of his pocket and he points at the name Rose Baker, covered in snow in the front of our building. Now the motherfucker's sitting here posing like Usain Bolt. You all right, fam? I asked him. Better than ever, big bro. He says, he started tossing me his phone through the driver's side window. I found the code, big bro. Our friend tells me that the code is called Black Madness. It's the first time I've seen our friend with this suspect of a hairline. His widow's peak has a widow's peak. And that widow's peak is like a new, <laughs> a new kind of nappy. He's rocking these oversized Carhartt sweatshirts that he wore the first day I met him 12 years ago. Our friends like long bow legs that were once like super thick with muscle. They're now wobbly, brittle. Our friend is pointing at his apartment building and yelling, Rose Baker, Rose Baker, big bro, over and over again outside of my truck. Rose Baker is the name of the apartment building that our friend lives in. Big bro is what our friend has insisted on calling me since I was his 26-year-old adjunct professor and he was my 19-year-old student. Rose Baker, he says again. Rose Baker was the all black dormitory in the 1970s. And before that it was home to Danielle Baker, the first black woman enrolled at our friend's college. I asked our friend again, if he's okay, before asking him where his partner Dion is. He says, Dion is down in the basement talking with someone. She hasn't spent the night in his bed, their bed for three months. He tells me that they still best friends, but Dion has fallen in love with a sharecropper. I look at our friend and I try not to blink, fam, for a good six seconds. I fell in love with the sharecropper too this week, he said. She. That nigga fine, big bro. She. Right, right, I say. Wondering whether that sentence actually needs two sheds. One shed will do. True sides, big bro. Our friend says out of nowhere, huh? True sides for what? I ask him. True sides, big bro. A run for your life. Either way, the world begins tonight. Wow. This little nigga really out here using bootleg Tracy Trapman lyrics 
to convey what? I don't ask our friend to explain himself anymore. I just say, I hear that and ask him if he feels okay. Final form, he say, big bro, I done reached final form. I ain't never felt better. I see my auntie who is currently trying to work through an episode without medication. I remember when she said never felt better. I see my father sitting dull in a flowy white gown at St. Francis. I remember him saying he never felt better. I hear myself in 2009, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and so on. I remember myself saying I never felt better. And when I never felt better, I loved when folks who loved me called me crazy. I hated when folks who loved me called me sick. Our friend says he wants to show me something on the other side of the quad, even though it's dark, big bro, he says. That snow, it be illuminating. I put on one mask, I put on two masks, I put on three masks, I rip all three and I get out of my car. We walk right across the street from the building and we're standing outside at a restaurant on a quad at a restaurant called Feverly's. Our friend says Feverly's is the bougiest place in and around campus next to his faculty meetings. He and Dion come here once a month, once a month, once a month, once a month on payday. We stand outside of Feverly's and watch white folks act, move, talk like white folks. Some order off the menu. Some bring a little Tupperware filled with food from home. Some order nothing. They just drink. No one in the restaurant or in the area under the tents has on masks except the black workers. Listen, our friend says. I'm listening, but I don't hear shit. A notch or two beneath the empty chatter and ding dinging of forks on empty plates. I hear the most terrifying and somehow familiar sound I'd ever heard, quote. Wow, so good. Wow, so good. Wow, so good. I tell our friends how nuts it is that I've never heard that sound before. Wow, so good. Yes, you have, he says, wow. So good. You just blocked it out, big bro. It's a repressed sonic memory. It's a niggerish response to white folks' response to trauma. Wow, so good. Court, even the white folks eating hard ass rutabagas out of Tupperware were saying the same thing. Wow, so good. You blocked it out, big bro. You blocked it out. Our friend's campus sits in the valley of what folks in the area call the presidential hills. Watching the quad from Feverly's, especially around dust, the campus looks like it's cupped in a misty force field. Rising above the force field are the pointy tops of brick castles where students commit felonies, get better or worse at love, write sentences and read minuscule parts of books. Wow, so good. We keep walking across the quad and our friend points to the far corner. He says for the last six days that the corner has been filled with black folk. He says that the group of about 200 niggas were niggas who work buildings and grounds, niggas who work in cafeterias, niggas from town, niggas from forest, behind the college, niggas, niggas everywhere. It sounded like heaven. Our friend says, I would have loved to see them occupying the quad. He says that there were big heads and small heads. There were weaves, fades, and braids. There were long arms and short arms. There were chucks, flats, and jays. I asked this nigga, why is he rhyming? I already told you, big bro. I don't reach final form. We make it close to the edge of the quad and our friend tells me that a little over a week ago, a man named Lavelle Porter's twin sister was arrested for jaywalking in the middle of Main Street. When the cops approached and asked Imani, his sister, for her ID, one of the cops said he saw her pull out a gun. She actually pulled out a license and a box cutter to protect herself. Imani's primary job was working a cashier at the cafeteria on campus. She spent her nights literally cutting open boxes at the new stop and shop. Stop and shop. Stop and shop. Stop and shop. 
off of Dave Avenue, or is it Dave? The bullet ruptured her spleen. It ruptured her rapture. It actually ruptured her spleen. And she's been in trauma center at St. Francis ever since. The bullet was ruptured as it ruptured her spleen. The bullet ruptured her spleen and she's been in trauma center at St. Francis ever since. The day after Imani was shot, Lavelle dressed up like a sharecropper and he and every nigga tired of masking madness marched to the center of that quad. Immediately, President Dyer called a socially distanced meeting of all three tenured or tenure track black faculty on campus. Our friend and his former partner Dion, the two who responded to the president's email arrived to that meeting 10 minutes earlier. At the meeting, President Dyer ate them old nasty ass finger foods they love to eat and she made clear her commitment to diversity and inclusion. She doubled down on all that she'd done for town gown relations. She bragged about being on the governor's outreach team for niggas scared to get vaccines. She ain't say niggas though. She said Afro-Americans. After our friend and Dion stopped faking, President Dye asked Dion if she would be a bit more diligent when vetting the student and employees emails for words like riot, shooting, drug, stabbing, Colin, Kaepernick, white, devils, black, lives, matter. President Dye gave Dion the title of outreach executive in addition to her position as chair of women's studies, though she was not tenured. As outreach executive, she was to vet all emails for potential terror while highlighting the campus diversity to its alums. President Dye didn't ask our friend anything. She simply let him know how much she appreciated his ability to talk to both sides, to find common ground. She told him that the folks occupying the quad and the black students potentially inspired by the occupation really, really looked up to him and she wanted it to stay that way. Our friend and I, I'm listening to him. Our friend and I, I think it's just our friend. Our friend heard the president's plea as a simple quid pro quo. Tell the president what the job is. Tell the president what the group is. Tell the president what the black group is planning and you will get tenure. Tell the president what the black group is planning and you will get tenure. Tell the president what those black people are planning and you will get, and you will get tenure. Fail to tell the black president what the group is planning and you will lose your job. Wow, so good. Our friend and I just stood there and we looked at each other until we looked past ourselves, past our lives, past the castles, past the hills, past Rembrandt's little playground, past the labs filled with animals waiting to die for our sins, past hanging moss and misty trees, past the buildings named for white men, good at stealing and sealing ghostly futures, past, wow, so good, past the fading summits of every mountain cradle in the school, then slowly, very slowly, I followed our friend out of the center of this place I should have never ever seen as scary. Some niggas never stop dying, big bro. Our friend says, once we get to the cemetery on the other side of the quad, them same folks, don't, they, they don't never stop living either. But, but, but something is about to die, big bro. Some about to die, big bro. Some about to live, big bro. But some about to die, big bro. I'm good, big bro. Don't worry about me, big bro. And so on, and so on. This is the story our friend told me once we got into the cemetery. Earlene Rose taught children in a tiny one-room schoolhouse in Rosedale, Mississippi during the days in 1946. In the evening, she worked in the house of Ann Scott, the wealthiest white family in town. At night, she sold sweet food for her porch from the, for the community. At night, she sold sweet food from her porch for the community. At night, she sold food that was sweet off her porch for the community. At night, she sold sweet food for her porch for the community. Ann Scott's family did not want her to go so far for an education alone, as was common for some moneyed white women in the area, in the region. They said she could only attend a college in New England if Erlene came with her. Erlene, who was without child and without parents and without partner, stopped teaching at the school 
She stopped selling sweets and packed everything she thought she needed for eight months in New England. This was her first time outside of Rosedale. In Mississippi, Ann Scott called Erlene Mama Rose. At the college, the white woman in the dorm called Erlene Ann Scott's maid. She slept in a narrow long closet with no windows off of Ann Scott's room. She had her own sink, a commode, a mirror. Arlene made sure Ann Scott's clothes were washed and ironed. She cleaned Ann Scott's room when Ann Scott was out. She made food for Ann Scott and her friends when they were hungry. That first month of school, Arlene provided Ann's floor and then eventually the whole dorm with tea cakes, banana pudding, pickles, flavored sugar water, sour cream cake, butterscotch, peppermints, the world's finest chocolate. One night, a second year student from Great Barrington named Danielle Baker stayed a little longer after smashing her tea cake. You make the best tea cakes I ever tasted, Mama Rose, Danielle said. Arlene looked at her like her bread one done. I know that's right, but you ain't never had no tea cakes, have you? <laughs> Let me find out you an old tea cake eater from way back, she said. Danielle started laughing. Can I ask you something? You mind if I call you Mama Rose? Erlene ignored her. How it feel? How's what feel, she asked. You know, being the only one. I feel like home, I reckon, Erlene said. No, I'm really asking, do you ever get like sick of like, you know, us touching you, you know, acting like we know you, you know, and then we get to go learn all day and you just gotta sit here in this room and ain't no windows and you know wash clothes and sew and make us whatever we want is that what you think i do all day well I, is that what you think i do i do a little bit more than that Erlene told her i make a lot of things i make things to keep me alive i make time too and sometimes i make time to watch you Erlene thought she had it. I make time to watch you too, Danielle told Erlene. Can I call you the candy lady? Erlene responded, that's crazy. That's what folks call me back home. I would appreciate you calling me the candy lady. It make way more sense than Mama Rose. Look here though, I don't want you watching me. Arlene didn't simply see something familiar in Danielle, she heard Danielle. That as much as anything is why Arlene suspected Danielle was what and who was not what and who she said she was. Danielle was not what and or who she said she was. That as much as anything is why Arlene suspected Danielle was not what she said she was. That first semester, Danielle and Erlene spent every early morning together, whispering, listening, watching those presidential hills. The morning that Danielle admitted to Erlene that she was passing was the first night that they spent together in a biology lab. Erlene could not stop laughing. What's so funny? Danielle asked her. Chow, you really thought you was out here passing? <laughs> passing the who? Look at your forehead, girl. What white girl you know blessed like that? Oh my God. Erlene and Danielle explored every inch of the shadowy parts of campus and town in the early mornings when everyone else was asleep. No matter where the trek started, they always ended up in the same place, the biology lab, where they experimented with words, touch, madness, sciences. At dusk near the end of the spring semester, Danielle walked Erlene across the quad in the cemetery for the first time. Erlene's index finger tingled as Danielle held it index finger in hand, Erlene explained in bruising detail why she really was in New England, what she really planned to take back to Mississippi. Two weekends later, when Ann Scott went looking for Dion, two weeks later, when Ann Scott went looking for Erlene, she found her holding Danielle in the lab. Ann Scott promised the women she wouldn't tell a soul. Two weeks later, when Ann Scott went looking for Erlene, she found her holding Danielle in a lab. Two weeks later, when Ann Scott went looking for, she found her holding Danielle in the lab. Ann Scott promised the woman she wouldn't tell a soul. She said she believed everyone should be free to love however they please. 
Arlene watched the little crow's feet and Anne Scott's eyes twinkle and she knew what would happen next. Before morning, every woman in the dorm knew that Diane Rose and Danielle Baker were in the lab experimenting. Later that night, the entire dorm fell horribly sick. Everyone except Erlene and Danielle was dehydrated and having trouble breathing. Of course, they blamed their illness on the candy lady. Erlene didn't wait for the inevitable. She knew she had to get out and get back to Mississippi. First, she had to get out of that dorm. As she was trying to get from the top floor to the first floor, one by one, the doors of the dorm opened and fatigued white woman after fatigued white woman after fatigued black woman passing as fatigued white woman came out of their room with scissors and pencils and pens and fabric balled into ropes. Earlene Baker, the candy lady, never came out of that dormitory. And you know white folk. They erased what actually happened in that building and turned around and named the dorm after Erlene and Danielle. And that's why we call it Rose Baker. This is the story our friend told me as we walked back from the cemetery to the front of Rose Baker, his apartment. Our friend explained to me that there's no way to honor the dead if you neglect the folk ways that kept them alive. Our friend explained to me that there's no way to honor the dead if you neglect the folk ways that keep them alive. Therefore, he asserts, we have to use storytelling and science not to bring the dead back, but to feed pleasure to the dead. The black dead want to feel good, he says, and they rely on the black living for pleasure. When I asked him how we feed pleasure to the black dead, that's when I realized I needed to get the fuck up out of there. Our friend said that every dead black person in this country died prematurely from white folk. I asked him if he meant white supremacy when he said white folk. He said, black madness don't use words that dull terror. Ain't no microaggressions in black madness. Ain't no white supremacy. Ain't no white privilege, he told me. Terrible white shit is done by terrible white folk who refuse to stop being terrible. Big bro, it ain't hard, hence, Every dead black person in this country dies prematurely from white folk. And every living black person in this country lives knowing that white folk want us dead prematurely. This, he claims, is not analysis. It's descriptive, big bro. I don't think you get it. You taught me this shit. We want our black dead to feel good, right? They deserve it. And you telling me, I say to him, that they're solely relying on white suffering for pleasure? Not at all. Not solely, he says. But big bro, white suffering at the hands of loving black folk is one of them things that bring the black dead and the black living pleasure. I mean, who don't like seeing cheaters lose? And for folks who don't know how to lose, losing is suffering. I'm not finna debate that with you, big bro. We know it's true. We give our daily bread to ensuring that we will not waste our ancestor survival. Lisa Thompson said that shit. This that black madness, baby. Each of us has a set of blessings. Blessings, I ask him. You talking about like, when my grandma and them used to give us savings bonds, my nigga? No, big bro. Black blessings are powers. Listen, I want to say something to you. What? I think that's what people didn't understand about Courtney Baker's work. He tells me, she's arguing that the black dead need us. They want us to make art of their premature complicated deaths precisely because that is the art that most fortifies the living. This makes the black dead feel good. I gave our friend a customary, I know that's right, before telling him I was gonna holla at him. There's way too much black madness for me. You need to know this, our breath. You need to know this, our friend says. Big bro, come here, the candy lady. She's in my apartment building. 
and she would like to talk to you. That's when I realized that I was definitely in somebody else's horror novel. Our friend loves to mess with language, but he would never say she would like to talk with you unless something was irrevocably wrong. At this point, I've read and I've seen and I heard enough. I just wanted to go to sleep and I want this man to stop talking to me. We're standing there outside of Rose Baker and he's looking at my hips. They are still wide. And I'm steady looking at them presidential hills. They are still white. You ever think about, hey bro, come here, let me ask you something. I'm scared to touch our friend at this point. Big bro, I got a serious question for you, fam. You ever think about how crazy it is that all Terry Crews had to do was shake his titties for the rest of his life and he'd be a multimillionaire, big bro. Did you know that? No, I say to our friend. I've never thought about Terry Crews' titties except when I'm watching Terry Crews' titties. I'm not even sure we're supposed to be talking about Terry Crews' titties. Are we supposed to say Terry Crews' chest? Big bro. Terry Crews be moving his titties and a nigga could have made a million dollars moving his titties. That's all I'm saying, big bro. And I'm also saying that the candy lady is inside with the sharecropper and the plug and the imagination. And they told me they want to talk to you. If my hips weren't fucked up, I would have taken off running but I'm thinking, damn, my nigga, you gotta be real strategic. This is a different kind of crazy. So I'm setting up my sprint with some bullshit ass questions. So I'm like, okay, I got you. Okay, so so black madness, y'all y'all like Afro pessimists. We are real nigga shit, our friend says. And for the first time in my life, I, I don't really understand what real nigga shit means in this context. We believe, he says, that white folk ain't shit because white folk choose not to be shit. We will sacrifice no more dead niggas for their progress. They must sacrifice their own. We believe dead niggas and alive niggas are worth loving into infinity. If that's Afro-pessimism, big bro, we Afro-pessimists. If that's Afro-futurism, big bro, we Afro-futurists. We just think that's real nigga shit. We real niggas, big bro. Fat, ugly, queer, you know, liquefied, dry, dusty, real nigga shit, big bro. This black madness. Okay, okay, I say backing up. So y'all are real niggas with superpowers. Big bro. My friend says, and finally touches my shoulder. Real niggas with superpower? That's the greatest oxymoron of all times. Real niggas are superpower. Almost worse than the worst of white folks is the nigga who gives their entire life to ensuring more niggas suffer so they can feel good. Accept your superpower, nigga, you taught me. I looked at our friend and I waited for that punchy dialogue that would help me understand where we were. I hate books, big bro, he said instead and got right up in my face. I hate motherfucking books. That's why I be writing, big bro because I hate books. Our friend hugged my neck. I couldn't tell if he was laughing or crying. He just kept telling me, I love you. And I kept telling him, I love you. I know you think I'm sick, he said. You think I'm manic. You think I'm manic. You think I'm having one of them episodes. I'm not, this ain't no episode. It's a novella, nigga. This an essay, nigga. Nigga, I'm an essay, nigga. I got these business cards right here with BM on them, nigga. BM, you know what BM stand for? Black madness, nigga. I'm an essay. Our phone's phone, our friend's phone. Our friend's phone rang. He let go of the hug. I'm standing there trying to fake yawn when I see the name on the phone glow blue over our friend's shoulder. I dropped my keys. Oh, shit. Yeah, I'm gonna just run to the car and get my phone, I told our friend. I'm gonna be in there directly. What, what, what apartment you in again? Our friend turned to me 
the phone to his left ear and said, that's what's up, big bro. I knew you was going to come through. Yo, go on and get your phone and then come in. I can display more when you come in. When you talk, when you walk, when you, when you talk to me though, no, wait, when you walk in the side door, I want you to go straight downstairs to the basement. Then, wait, then to whomever he was talking on the phone, I heard our friend say, Yo, tell her we both be down there directly. I turned my back on our friend and I walked to the car. I'd somehow crawled into the middle of an episode, an essay, a novella, a long, long something I would not make to the end. I turned my back on our friend and I walked to the car. I'd somehow crawled into the middle of an episode, an essay, a novella that I would not want to make it to the end. You wrote, Courtney, and looking at the dead or dying body in person or in a photographic representation, there is no egalitarian reciprocity at play. In semiotic terms, the dead are not merely incapable of self-representation through language, rather they are antithetical to language itself. It is not the dead are beyond capture of a self-constituting language, but they are irredeemably cut off from the language, forever unable to speak for themselves and about themselves. This is what I felt sitting in that car, contemplating how to complete the call I know I needed to make. Did it actually cost too much to make the Black Dead feel good? Did it cost too much to make the Black Dead feel good? I've been thinking, wondering for years about how to best make a horror located on a so-called elite college campus. I finally understood for us, it wasn't the lies, the hills, the terrifying gnomes, the graveyard, the creepy campus ends, the scared animals waiting to die for our sins. It wasn't the hanging moss, the mist, the violent ordering of labor. It wasn't the cracking white buildings named for cracked white men, excellent at sealing past and stealing futures. It's not the feckless belief, more plentiful than air itself on these campuses, that reading and writing necessarily make us less violent and more innocent. It wasn't even the white folks, Courtney. That's what's crazy. White formerly educated Americans did everything to remind us that they were the most evil, graceless decision makers ever created. But evil and gracelessness were not the horror. They were undeserving of such a designation. Black madness was horror and comedy, but horror and comedy, but horror, but comedy. Black madness made so much sense. Black madness was a short story about two black boys walking across a quad. Black madness was a novel about two black girls vowing to never betray each other in a science lab. Black madness was a poem about a couple of black professors falling in love with the character named the sharecropper. Black Madness was not my novel, though I want credit and money for telling it. Black Madness has always belonged to Earlene Rose, the candy lady. And the candy lady has no interest in black stories cosplaying as white fantasy. Courtney, I sat there in the warm leather of that car that is hybrid, paid for with money earned at talking shit on these white American campuses. And there I understood why helping white folk humiliate niggas and writing about helping white folk humiliate niggas costs far less than committing to a life of making our black dad feel good. One thing I mastered growing up on these college campuses was the power to congratulate ourselves for gesturing at questions my body did not have the will to consider. And I summoned that power yesterday. Our friend never said anything about why we would want to privilege the prematurely dead over the prematurely dying. He didn't talk about how making sure our black dead feel good might mean we are neglecting the pleasure created and experienced by the black living for premature death. He didn't talk about the gendered place and class asymmetry that exists even in our fantasies about pleasure. Who was being pleasured? How were they being pleasured? How much did that pleasure cost the pleasurer and that person gaining pleasure? I could come up with questions until the sun died, but there was no need. The questions served their purpose and they got me. The questions served their purpose. The questions served their purpose and they got me away from bodily risk. Fuck. I really wanted to just say the questions that served their purpose and left it at that, but I don't think I did enough work in this piece yet to make and gotten away with love, parenthetical or understood. But this is awesome bullshit. I knew what I had to do. Another kind of real nigga shit. Yes, President Dye.
Thanks for taking my call. I'd like to keep this conversation off the record if we could. Great, great. So one of your faculty members is dealing with a severe case of bipolar disorder. I think it was triggered by, excuse me? Yes. The young man was my student a few years ago. He watched me go through a similar episode actually. Yeah, I'm calling because his behavior is undermining the vitality and the livelihood of your institution. Yes, he's at his apartment right now, Rose Baker, yep. He says some things that concern me, that's all. I'm not sure if he has weapons, excuse me? Is he alone? No, I don't think he's alone. Yes, the people with him are black. Yes, he, him, his are his desired pronouns. No, he does not have peanut allergies. Is he able-bodied? Is he able-bodied? Is he able-bodied? Wow, so good. Um, yes, yes, he is able-bodied. Yes, yes. I think you should send the town police immediately to the basement of Rose Baker. Yes, I'm saying that's a good idea. Okay. Yes, yes. I love to talk more about ways to diversify your faculty. Absolutely. Okay. I'll wait here until the police arrive. Okay, yeah. I'll wait here until the police arrive just to make sure my friend knows I would never ever let anything happen to him. Black madness. Court, you there? Um, barely. <laughs> How wow. are you? Fan, we got nine minutes. I know we have nine minutes and um, yeah, I'm gonna say this. You really challenge, I'm so grateful to you for this. When you first sent it to me, I was excited and then also scared. And I was like, well, that's appropriate. It's a horror story. But I realized I was scared of it in a, in a very specific way of being afraid to find myself in what you had written. Mm. But then you had said to me, you had written something like, um, it's funny too, or don't forget to laugh. And I, was, I just wanna say, I'm so grateful that you reminded me of that. Mm. Um, Why do you think we need permission to laugh when we aren't in the same space? Um, well, I mean, for me, I was just th thinking about, you know, I, I, knew you, I knew you were touching on some of our experiences, which resemble, I mean, you challenge the word. It's not even that they resemble a horror story on these campuses. It's that they are but that horror isn't even the right word. And madness isn't, thank you, Tariq, Dr. Tariq Pickens, isn't quite the right word right. either. Um, so there's, I mean, it made me think about how, how many folks are probably familiar, maybe more with your essays and your memoir, and maybe not as familiar with your, the way that you gravitate towards creative writing creative writing, another term that doesn't maybe fit. But um, yeah, this, I wanted to ask you about, about using the terms that I've inherited that are inadequate. Okay, right? but can I ask you? To let. But yeah. whenever we talk, I always feel like yes. the conversation, like, I feel like my side of the conversation always remembers like what you, who you are like to my fucking foundational way of understanding and thinking. That's and, bizarre. <laughs> okay, it could be bizarre, fam. But like I was, okay. I drowned myself in your book uh, completely, and around the principle of like you know if if the black dead actually do not have language, what then do they have? And ultimately, like what do we owe them? And what is owed to the living? And 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 you talk about the the, the scary part of of what we do. To me, 
and this is this to me is frightening. Like, I don't think there's anything white folks in this world could do. I'm not gonna say you, but to me, that would scare me. But niggas scare the fuck out of me every day because I know what this shit encourages us to do to ourselves and to each other, especially at work. And when we on these college campuses, even though they talk about all that home and shit, we at work, you know? And your work, your Bad work has made me think about the responsibility we have as fractured as it is, and that's a question mark, to bring the black dead with us into work. I don't know. You, you, made, you, you made me sit with that. And I'm thankful. Well, I'm thankful. I'm thankful that, that my sitting with the dead, um, which was in, in, and I was taught by learning about not having the opportunity to read, but Mamie Till Mobley sitting with her yes. dead son. Right. I mean, I was thinking back on that last night. I mean, just uh, another word that in a, in a black sense, is is too small brilliant so not just brilliant as an activist and not just brilliant as a mother just brilliant in in emotionally in, in all of these ways um of sitting with our birth and our death and trying to make them ring out and and uh, and you say that court like it's like you you just made me realize that it it's it's beyond work, it's beyond language, right? I'm trying to ironically write into that space beyond language, yeah. which is which which means I'm inevitably going to fail. But it's beyond language to consider that this country has inadvertently created the most radical, loving decision makers in Black women, while consistently saying we don't want you making any meaningful decisions about how the fuck this shit is governed. So Mamie Till, to me and fucking you, and Ella Baker, and Fannie Lou Hamer, and my grandmama to different degrees. I'm not saying, I mean, I know y'all, you know, everybody messed up and fucked up, you know, but you got the law of decision-making when it's incredible decision-making when it's made. And, and, and so for me, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that what happens, what happens to us psychologically sometimes when, when, when work is pushing us to make these decisions that aren't in the interest of anybody except the worst part of them. You know what I'm trying to say? Um, yeah, and I want to say one more thing about our friend because people people keep asking me. People keep asking in the chat I just saw about our friend. I mean, <laughs> we know our friend. Some of these people know our friend, um, and and you're gonna know our friend a little bit more probably in the, in, in the next few months or a year. But we know him. Yeah, you you've met him. People look at him. Speaking yeah. of the chat, uh, I I I I want to bring. I can always talk to you for like 24 hours, even though I. I don't and we really need to catch up on whose line is it anyway sometimes <laughs> and, and really really laugh i really want to do that and i love that you're drinking out of a mason jar keeping it keeping it honest oh <laughs> that's just how we drink that's just how we drink and i know it's water um i want to get to a couple of, of questions um if that's okay especially since you're already talking about decision making and and who's able to, allowed to be in the room and, and breaking down language, um, acknowledging the way that language is a kind of institution that doesn't necessarily accommodate us. Um, so Tony Jerome, who self-identifies as a black autistic writer asked, <laughs> how did you do this? How did you conjure this and theater your own story? And I think theater is a verb there. I think it- Yeah, the theater is a verb. How, how, how did you bring me here with you? Thank you so much. And is there any way, well, it can be your criticism, blah, blah, blah. Um, but can you talk about like the craft and, and your thinking of getting passed through language, play, play and horror? Yeah, yeah, you terror? know, I, I wrote, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm working on a, a larger book, but like whenever I do anything like this, I want to, um, I, wanna, I wanna create something for the performance. And, and Zoom, as, as we all know, is, is like, it's, it's so important and useful and shit, but I hate it, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and that's why like there's a line in that shit about hating work, work, work and book. I mean, I think a lot of us grew up hating, hating, hating reading, right? Like hating the art that came before us. And, and I just hate Zoom, fam. And, I, and, 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 and something happened yesterday and yesterday before that and yesterday before that. And when we get on these Zooms, I think a lot of us sometimes try to perform for people 
for whom we can never perform <laughs> enough. And I just wanted to actually create something for you, Courtney, with the awareness that other people are gonna be watching um, that is that is part and parcel of like the book I'm writing. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, and, and, and that's it, fam. I mean, I know we gotta get up out of here, but I just wanna say there, there are no words for how indebted and thankful I am to you for this, for your work um, and for this space. So thank you for giving me sort of like permission to do like the most nigga shit that I could do on Zoom affiliated with Radcliffe. You, you, you let me love myself and, and laugh today in a way that I need it. So thank mm -hmm. you. Well, I'm grateful for that. And I will just say to you that with, with as many people who can hear um, what one of my teachers, Wani Malubiano said about why she became a scholar so that she could be smart enough to understand Toni Morrison's work. The same wow. was true for me, for you. That's so sweet. You challenge Thank me you, constantly. Thank you, fam. Thank so, you. so we're gonna keep we're gonna keep chat chatting because we're kin. Um, and right now, I am going to, with enormous gratitude, turn things back over to Dean <laughs> Tamiko Brown Nagan for, uh, with gratitude to Kiese Lehman and to Radcliffe for this opportunity. Thank you. Well, thanks everyone. Thank Thank you, Kiese and, and Courtney for this fascinating program. And of course, thanks to everyone who joined us this afternoon. Have a nice evening. Take care.